Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, as we continue our walk through the book of Acts. You guys look good this morning. All right, you feeling good? Hey, I, I expect uh, just as many of you that came up with a little snarky remark about Appalachian State last week to just come up and congratulate me uh, with a win over Miami. I'll see you in the, in the plaza. It'll be, it'll be great. It'll be great. Okay, we've been walking through uh, the book of Acts, and it, it's going to take us a little longer, particularly at the beginning of the book of Acts. Uh, and the reason is, as I've told you, I don't want to keep reiterating to you that the book of Acts is a hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? And so I, I'm going to be doing a, a lot of teaching and explaining of uh, the Scripture and how to read your Bible, going back and pulling Old Testament themes and weaving them through so that you understand. And I know some of you are like, like teacher, just, just give me the answer to the exam. I don't care about how to do the math problem. I just want to know what the answer is. But listen, it's actually really, really important. We're, we're going to come back to this at the very end because we're going to land on praying in Jesus' name and having power in prayer and, and actually realizing all that is available to us. And the reality is, is you have to know how God has revealed himself. That God has been revealing himself and telling a story, an unfolding of who he is, and you must approach him on his terms. It's going to be really important so the beginning of Acts, Jesus has ascended into the throne room of heaven. He has gone into the heavenly temple, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. And he has been enthroned. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He told his disciples to go and to, to wait in Jerusalem. And last week, we looked at Luke's account at Pentecost. And last week, we looked, and I wanted to show you how, how all of the festivals were pointing to Jesus, how the Passover points to Jesus, and even the first fruits is Jesus' resurrection from the dead. You were to bring one sheaf to the temple on the first day after the the Passover Sabbath, and then how Pentecost, the celebration of the harvest celebration, was the ingathering of that which was scattered that God has gathered. So for 1,500 years, God was perfectly planning out feasts, making all of them point to Jesus and what he was going to do for his people. And, and last week I just said, can't you imagine the delight of God as the Spirit was being poured out, as he was gathering together? We also saw how Pentecost is the unfolding or, or the undoing of Babel. Remember Babel in Genesis 11, how man wanting to make a name for himself, not obeying God by spreading out throughout the earth, gathered together and they built this giant tower and so the Lord is forced to judge them and to confuse their languages. But at Pentecost, it's the undoing of Babel that the Spirit of God falls and suddenly they are able to speak praises of God in all these 15 plus languages, uniting that which culture divides in the name of Jesus. So we saw that last week. In fact, there was too much to cover last week, so I'm just redoing the whole thing this week, except now this week we're looking at, and this is very important, how we at Pentecost, the coming Holy Spirit, you and I become the living temple of God. We're just going to focus, we're going to meditate on that. that. That truth is so magnificent. I mean, for, for you and I, if we're honest, it's, it's, we treat it mundane because we, we know it up here, but to genuinely process and to think, you mean God Almighty has created me so that his spirit could indwell me. 
Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about this morning, that we become the living temple of God. So in Acts 2, I'm going to pick up uh, in verse 14, remember the scene, that this, and I'm going to reset this in just a second, but the Spirit of God has fallen in fire, tongues has come upon each of them, they're able to, to do this miraculous sign of language, there, there was a noise that was so loud that it was heard for miles around causing fire thousands to be gathered together, they show up and they say, what is this? What is going on? And Peter stands up, verse 14, then Peter, taking his stand with the 11, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. That's 9 a.m. It's 9 a.m. We're not drunk. But this is what has been spoken of through the prophet Joel. Then he quotes Joel chapter 2. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And even on my, my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we gather around your word, we pause to just humble ourselves and declare to you, who are we that you would be mindful of us, that you would care for us so much that you made us in your image so that we might be filled with your Holy Spirit? Who are we that you would give your son for us that you would become incarnate and that you would die in our stead. Who are we that you have made us your living temple that when we gather together and sing your praise and pray your name and gather around your word that you speak to us, that you convict us? Father, we welcome your conviction this morning because you are so good. That when you convict, you heal, and you give us the ability to walk out in newness of life. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes this morning to, to a truth that, that we probably think is, is so routine that we've been told our entire lives that your spirit can indwell us. May we see it fresh and anew this morning. God, that you would indwell us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the disciples, following Jesus' final instructions at his ascension, he said, go back to Jerusalem and wait. You need for me to be enthroned in heaven, and then the Father will send the Holy Spirit who will indwell you with power so that you will be my witnesses. And that is what they do. They are gathered together, 120 of them, Luke tells us, near the temple to celebrate Pentecost, when suddenly a sound that is so violent it shook the walls and could be heard for miles around. I told you last week, it, 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 think of like an F-16 that does a flyover at a football game. It just reverberates. Luke tells us a noise came from heaven like a violent rushing wind. There weren't any wind effects, just a deafening roar that gathered thousands to that single location. With it, an amazing sight came with the noise. 
gathered there in that upper room, they looked up and they saw fire. Something that started in one ball in the middle of the room and then separated and went and rest upon each one of them. Now, fire as a symbol of God's presence is very important. And this is where we are. This is why we came back to this this week. Because God had appeared many times before in fire, in the burning bush with Moses. Atop Mount Sinai, all of Israel goes back to Sinai. Okay, they, they get fenced off. They have to stay at the bottom. And at the top, there's an earthquake and flashes of lightning and fire at the top of the mountain. As they're going through the desert towards the promised land, there is a pillar of fire and a cloud that leads them. What became known as the Shekinah glory of the Lord, that at the end of Exodus, after the tabernacle is built, the Shekinah glory falls upon and enters into the tabernacle. And then again in Solomon's temple in 2 Chronicles 7. It's important enough for me to read it to you, the first three verses of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And put yourself there at the scene. Now when Solomon had finished praying, Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the sons of Israel, seeing the fire that had come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave praise to the Lord saying, he tr truly, he is good and truly his loving kindness is everlasting. The Shekinah glory of the Lord falls upon the temple and Jesus stands in the temple and says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And the disciples would come to know he is talking about his body. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus died upon the cross, that there was an earthquake and the temple veil was split from top to bottom of the Holy of Holies. And so now here we are on Pentecost and the sign of fire accompanied by a fantastic, violent sound that is heard from miles around that shakes the ground as when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai because the Holy Spirit of God has fallen but now fills his people. Do you see this movement? Do you see the intentionality of the Bible, the reuse of the signs, supposed to point you to the fact that now that Jesus is enthroned, this is why you are to wait for his enthronement, because he is the high priest. He entered into the heavenly temple, and now he has sent his spirit that the presence of God on earth indwells his people. And as we studied last week, this magnificent movement, this what God is accomplishing is accompanied by a miraculous sign. That is, 120 disciples are suddenly able to speak in 15 plus foreign languages. They are praising God, telling of God's mighty deeds, and, and the Spirit begins to give them utterance so that they are able to speak in all of these different languages. And because of that sound that had been heard for miles around, thousands have gathered together, and when they show up, suddenly they hear their native-born tongue, and Arabs and Libyans and Egyptians all hear their native tongue. 
Now, I want to pause here and I want to give some helpful comments that are going to explain our own personal experiences. I need to give us a, a focus and then we can get excited at the end. I'll focus us so that we can get excited at the end. At the end of Peter's sermon, he, he's going to tell that crowd to repent to be baptized in Jesus' name, and they too will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 of them are going to get saved that day. But we are not told, nor are we to presume, that fire again fell from heaven on each one of them, nor that they too began to speak in other languages. In fact, all we are told there in Acts 2 is that the miraculous signs kept taking place through the apostles. You see, it seems pretty obvious that the fire and languages are a powerful sign to signify the fact that Jesus has entered the throne room of heaven and now there's a transfer from God's presence in the temple to now we are the living temple into his people. So when I got saved at the age of 15, did you know that fire didn't fall from heaven upon me? But am I saved? I presume none of you had fire fall from heaven upon you when you got saved. You see, it's a sign of the monumental movement of the presence of God that Jesus has been enthroned. And that the Father has sent the promised Holy Spirit. Let's take it a step further. Because here in a moment, you're going to see Peter stand up and, and quote Joel 2, describing prophecy and dreams and visions. And when you comb through the book of Acts, dreams and visions will occur, but they're actually rare. And only a few men and women are designated as prophets. The Spirit does continually give power in order to witness, but it's never uniform or predictable in what God is going to do. It's not predictable. It's not a formula, a plug and play. What is fair to say is that the Spirit is directing ministry and care and empowering them to overcome and to move forward and to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. What is not fair to say is that any of this becomes normative for our experience. Normative, that means it becomes normal. You should expect this for you. I've told you before, I believe in miraculous gifts. But what we see in the health and wealth theology uh, in our culture is manipulative and toxic. Specifically, I'm talking about guaranteed healing, promised wealth, and tongues as a sign of salvation. So I want to show you that by a plain reading of the text, one can see that the experiences of the original disciples at Pentecost is, is not a simple paradigm to be transferred and applied to others. That's what I want you to see. You must know this because theology quickly gets off into some difficult, problematic areas. But I need to point this out to you, how to read your Bible. So let's reset the scene in your mind's eye. A violent noise that could be heard for miles around gathers thousands of people. When they show up, they are seeing and hearing the disciples speak in other languages, their native tongues. It is a miraculous sign. They are fascinated by it. They, thousands have gathered and they ask the question, what does this mean? And Peter stands up. Peter 
an uneducated fisherman with no more than a third grade education that Jesus found on the shores of Galilee. Peter, who 50 days prior had cut off a servant's ear and then later that night denied that he knew Jesus three times. How's that for a pedigree of the one who's going to stand up at Pentecost? That Peter stands up full of the Holy Spirit and begins to preach. Men of Jerusalem and all who've come all around, what you see and what you hear, that noise that you've heard and now what you see, this, this miracle of languages is a direct fulfillment of God's word that he had promised through the prophet Joel uh, more than 500 years ago. Amen. That's what he does. He stands up and he says, this is a direct fulfillment of what Joel promised. And then he begins to quote Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God said, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And, and even my bond slaves, that's, that's slaves, even slaves, both men and women, I will be those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. And so what did all the people gather together? They, they saw, they saw 120 men and women, young and old Galileans, we talked about that last week, uneducated. Who are those hick Galileans? They, they come, they see all of that, and they see this miracle. And Peter says, it's exactly what Joel prophesied would happen. They're all performing one miracle together. And then look at verse 19 and 20. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Did you know that a blood moon is caused by a lunar eclipse? That the moon, because it's in the earth's shadow, is only lit by dim light that is refracted and reddened by the Earth's atmosphere. Did you know that with today's technology, that we know the orbits of the heavenlies and all that moves around in the universe, that we know the orbits and the moon and the planets, all of that, and that we have computer programs that can come up with thing called Kepler's equation, and you can rewind time so that you could see what was going on in the heavens, and you can actually place yourself at a particular point on the earth, say, Jerusalem, and did you know that on, in A.D. 33, during the Passover, that there was a lunar eclipse? That's right, that God wove the death and timing of his son into the fabric of planetary orbits. So let's piece this together so that you genuinely understand the, the power and impact of what Peter is saying. The sun will be turned into darkness when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Mark uh, 15, verse 33, tells us that from noon to three o'clock, suddenly darkness came over the land. Matthew 27, 54 tells us that an earthquake occurred at his death, causing many of those who were there to say, truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. And that night, after extended darkness and an earthquake during the day, the moon rose blood red. And now, 50 days later, a violent 
noise that could be heard for miles around has gathered thousands of people in Jerusalem and they hear a miracle of people speaking their native tongue and language. They're, they're like, how is this happening? And then Peter stands up and says, I'll tell you what's happening. And if you would allow me to preach Peter's sermon in reverse, he says, listen, all of this points to the fact that Jesus is the son of God and that he has risen from the dead and that he is sitting at the father's right hand. That he is enthroned. That's why there are signs in heavens and on earth. Just as Joel predicted. And what you see right here. What you have gathered. Is the fact that God is pouring out his spirit on all mankind. Young and old. Rich and poor. Slaves free men. Whereas in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God fell on a select few prophets and kings, but would not permanently dwell, would come and go. Now the Spirit of God falls on all that are his and permanently indwells them. And the New Testament begins to use language like, you and I are the living temple of God. We are a kingdom of priests. Wherever, whenever, whomever, through Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God will indwell. Wherever, whenever, whomever. Let me give you examples in the book of Acts of where this is going. Because like in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested, right? They're beaten and they're threatened. And they come back to now a gathering of uh, 3,100 people. Maybe some have gone back to their places, but they come back and, and understandably the, the people of God are intimidated and they're, they're scared, they're fearful. But then they start to, to read God's word, and then they start to pray God's word back to him. And Acts 4 says the Holy Spirit fell again, refilling them. The place shook, and they went out with boldness and confidence. Wherever, whenever, whomever, the Spirit of God fills. Amen. Or in Acts chapter 9, when Paul is on the road to Damascus to persecute the church. And on the road to Damascus, the resurrected Lord appears to him and blinds him. And then he's told his, his friends, they help him to continue on into Damascus. Now, in Damascus, which by the way is Syria, okay, there is a disciple of the Lord named Ananias. And God speaks to him as if he is an Old Testament prophet, but he's not, all right? He's not a Levite. He's not anything special. He's just a disciple, okay? Just like you and me. And the Lord appears to him and says, listen, meet Paul on such and such street, and I need you to go pray over him. And when you pray over him, he will regain his sight and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And Ananias goes. Wherever, whenever, whomever. That you don't need a priest, you don't need a building, you don't need an offering. Because Jesus is the high priest and he has entered into the heavenly temple and he is the offering that, that allows us access to God and he has released the Holy Spirit of God upon us as his people, wherever, whenever, whomever, that God in his magnificent unfolding plan, the long-awaited plan, that when he created us, 
He envisioned us getting to this point. You know, every checkers piece is engraved with an insignia of a, of a crown because every piece is ultimately designed to be kinged. And when God made you, he made you and I to be filled with the Spirit of God. To guide you, to convict you, to empower you with spiritual gifts, to help you, to teach you, to remind you of God's word, that you, believer, are indwelt with God's very own presence. Do you marvel at that? Or has it just become, yeah, I know that. Yeah, of course I know that. Do you marvel at that news? It's magnificent. Anytime I speak with one of my favorite couples back in Plainview, a uh, church I came from, I, I ask this couple, how is Mark doing? You see, Mark is the son of a migrant field worker. He never knew his father, dropped out of high school because school wasn't for him. He was embarrassed by his English, and so he kept to his family and would only speak Spanish in a small circle. He came from a very poor family. The Lord used his mother's death. She was a strong believer, but he wasn't. But the Lord used his mother's death to grab a hold of him. And I had the awesome privilege of leading him to faith in Jesus in my office. You see, by the world's standards, he was forgotten. But to be able to sit there with him and to tell him to place his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ and to know that the Holy Spirit of God indwells him and to watch him change and grow in his faith and to pray with him, it's absolutely magnificent that the Spirit of God indwells us. Do you marvel at that? Or is that old news? I told you at the beginning where we would end, and that is this final point of application. <clears throat> Pastor, why, why do you weave through the Bible and tell us about the old picture of the tabernacle and the temple? Why is that important? Why don't we just hey, I have access to Jesus. I can pray anytime. Here's why it's important. God has revealed himself in this way because there is power in Jesus' name. Amen. That the God of the universe has revealed himself this way because you must approach him how he says and how he, look, it is his way or the highway. Do you need power when you pray? Do, do you ever feel like your prayers are not particularly effective? Might I suggest something that I think most often when Christians in our day and culture pray to God, we pray in the power of our own name. That is, we come to God because we think we're cute. We think we're something special, that we have a lot to offer, and that God is kind of in need of us. I've got a really good plan. God, I think you should do this. The reality is, is there is no power in your name. There's no power in your name. Why did God begin separated in a temple that only priests could go into only once a year. And then in the inner courtyard, only Jewish males. And then in the other courtyard, only Israelite women and children. 
And then Gentiles on the outside, far and removed. Why is all of that necessary? Why did there have to be a sacrifice? Why did there have to be washing? Why did the Levites have to dress a certain way and do all of those things? You know, that part of your Bible that you're just like, I don't like reading this part. This doesn't seem all that relevant to me. It is relevant. Here's why. It is showing you that God is holy, that he must be approached on his terms and his terms alone. And in and of yourself, you are sinful and you could never, ever, ever measure up. And the entire system, in and of yourself, you would always be on the outside looking in going, I sure wish I was the high priest. I just wish I was a Levite or, or an Israelite male. I'm all the way over here as a Gentile. Why is all of that important? Because in Jesus' name, Jesus has entered into the heavenly temple. You understand the tabernacle, as Moses saw it, was a picture of what was in heaven. Moses, make it like this because this is what it really looks like so that Jesus enters into the heavenly temple, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood because he is the high priest and he cleanses all. He brings genuine cleansing and then he sits at the father's right hand because he is enthroned and the father says, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies a footstool because he is enthroned. And now... Hebrews 4 says, because he is like us, because he has been tempted in every way that we have been, because he is sympathetic and understanding, because he has made a way, he sits at the Father's right hand and bids you come, because you will find grace and mercy to help in your time. Come. This is what it means to pray in Jesus' name. That you understand all that Christ has accomplished. That you understand that God is holy. That that those things haven't been done away with. That those things have been fulfilled. Are you following me? That these things have been fulfilled, all that Christ has accomplished on my, on my behalf, and I come in Jesus' name knowing that now he gives me mercy. And now he listens to my prayers. There is power. He teaches us to pray in his name. But if I would charge you, you're you're praying over your family and your grandchildren. Is there power when you pray? Do you genuinely know and understand what it means to pray in Jesus' name? It's why he has revealed all of this so that you would understand he has accomplished it all so that you can pray in his name. That there's power and authority that you would bear much fruit for the glory of his name. Not in your own name, in Jesus' name. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly Father, forgive us. Forgive us when we come in our own name. Forgive us whenever we take the magnificent movements of Scripture and we think so lightly of them. Allow us to see a picture of what is actually going on in heaven. In the heavenly temple, with Jesus at your right hand, bidding us to come. So that we pray in the power that is available to us through your spirit, accomplishing all that you desire in your timing and in your plans, that we would be witnesses and burning into the ends of the earth. That you would do a work amongst us in the midst of our divided culture. That we would see and we would know it is of God. 
because it is uniting that which the world divides. It is bringing peace and healing. And it is causing us to go out with a fervor for your kingdom. Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray in your name. To understand all that you've accomplished for us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.